Thrill Friendship League. And we are back with you with one of our favorite topics for the Friends Indeed series. Indeed, people love to eat, people love to cook. When you're stuck in your home, what else are you gonna do? And today we have a real treat for you with uh, some recipes from the Mediterranean, a personal gift from Chef Nir Tzuk, who said he wanted to give us a gift. And in a moment, you're gonna see what a gift it is. But first of all, we know we have folks that are chiming in from all around the world on this Sunday. So whether it's brunch or lunch or a dinner, we're gonna give you some really amazing ideas. I'm excited to see what we're gonna be cooking tonight with some brand new recipes uh, from the Mediterranean. So first of all, tell us, we know we have people on Zoom, we have people on Facebook, watch parties around the world that are, are, that are watching uh, today. Tell us about an Israeli dish that you just can't live without. One dish that, that just when you think about it, it brings you back to Israel. We're going to ask the same question to, to Chef uh, uh, Zouk in a minute. But but one, uh, um, you know, it could be the standard. It could be something that you've been missing in your home. And who knows? Maybe today we'll be able to give you a little bit of inspiration to even try some of this in your own, in your own home. So... Uh, 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 of course, we already have people, well, hummus has come up immediately from Mindy. Mm. We've seen falafel, chatzilim, uh, lots of chatzilim, um, marak katom, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, hummus and fool. Uh, I think we're going to see today that, you know, for those of you that, like me, the first time you experienced an Israeli meal, when they brought out so many dishes... Uh, on these small little trays, they brought it out in advance, and I ate so many of them. I, I never made it to the, to the to the main course. I thought, you know, it was impossible. So we see baba ganoush, we see chatzilim, we see um, uh, uh, from 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 people egg shakshuka. We've actually done that one before. Salat Israeli, Israeli salad. We have lots of people that are recalling lots of different salads. And if you're looking at your screen, you see. Uh, you're actually going to get to, to uh, uh, learn and watch from a real master chef here. So let me uh, turn over to our, our, our host today. You have the kitchen to yourself. You are, are, are treating us to a multi-course meal uh, near today. We're excited. We know, I know from your biography and our prior discussions that you've been cooking for a long time, long before quarantine. And if I understand correctly, you started when you were 13. So I don't know if that means you had to cook for your own bar mitzvah or not. But tell us about how you knew that this was the passion that you wanted to pursue in the culinary arts at age 13. And tell us a little bit about the journey you took before we jump into the dishes you're going to share today. So I was cooking since I'm 13 because I had an argument with my dad. But food was a passion of mine since I was born. We lived nearby to my grandmother and every day I used to have lunch with my parents and then go to my grandmother, which used to ask me, have you had lunch already? And I definitely said no. So I had two lunches every day until I was 13. And then one day I came to my dad and I said, hey, I need some money to go to the movies. He said, why? You watch movies on television all day. And then I told him something that only a 13-year-old kid can tell his dad. I'm never going to ask for money from you again. And I just went out and found my first job in the kitchen. And ever since I'm cooking, I don't think I missed a single day in my life. Wow. Uh, and my cooking took me all around the world. So it's a, it's a great privilege. Uh, for some reason, I became very famous for my cooking when I was very young. Uh, and I was invited to cook all around the world. So I've been to Japan, New Zealand, Australia, I've been cooking in Africa. Uh, so and now I'm at home, COVID. So tell us where you are near, where, I mean, where is home? And tell us a little bit about cooking from a home con uh, kitchen. Uh, uh, you know, it's different than where you're normally in a, in a big uh, restaurant kitchen or something like that, I assume, but it looks, your, your kitchen looks full, that's for sure. <laughs> so home is all Jaffa. I'm very lucky to live, uh, it's night here, so you can't see, but the sea 
is right in front of me, maybe 50 meters from the beach. Uh, and cooking at home is an amazing experience for me because until two years ago, I had multiple restaurants, which means cooking was for me more like teaching and developing recipes and traveling and uh, talking about money and food costs and uh, thinking about real estate. But the past year has been a great change for me because I came back to doing the cooking myself and hosting the people, which I haven't done in a long, long, long time. Uh, I was more into the design part of hosting experiences. And now it's really, you know, me standing, pickling, buying the fish, cutting the herbs, imagining every day what's going to be for dinner. And there's never, never two meals are the same here for the people coming. So it's a big change and it's great for me. I'm having a good time. It's not nice to say, but you know, there is a big uh, monstrous disease outside, but here at home, it's all flowers and good smells. Great. Um, so, Nir, we do have uh, 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 a, a little bit of feedback from um, on the audio at the moment. I'm wondering if you can unmute the phone near your your workspace and mute the other phone. Uh, to unmute it. Okay. Let's see if that reduces the echo at all. Unmute. Is, Is it better, better now? Well, we'll try it. Why don't Why don't we? Um, uh, Go ahead and uh, uh, jump into uh, the the main dish, the fish dish. Great. Tell us a little bit about it. If you're in Jaffa, does that mean you get to like literally go to the market right there and get fish uh, uh, fresh from uh, from the ocean? So actually, uh, it's, there's, there's no fish market in Jaffa, but I live about the pool. So every day when I walk around with the dogs, I meet the fishermen coming. And I get to choose great fish. And I have a favorite fisherman. His name is Rami. He has two small boats. And whenever he gets something beautiful, if I'm not coming, he's texting me. And I'm running down to the port to get it. So the fish we're going to make now is called Sayadir. It's a very traditional and old Jaffa dish. And it was made by the fishermen. It, it's a dish that's very easy to make. It's, it has my own twist. And it takes exactly 20 minutes to cook. Very easy. Preparation is faster than 20 minutes. So I have some vegetables. I'm like almost every cooking in the world. Start with some frying onion. I think that's, that goes across the board for every cuisine. We always start by frying the onion. It always goes into the pot first. Now, beside the onion and the fish and the rice, all the rest is a privilege. They used to say that basically every fisherman used to bring the leftovers from his family dinner and from whatever leftovers, vegetables they had, they made this dish. I think it's a good story. I don't know if it's true or not. I wouldn't <laughs> sign on it. So I'm starting with a little bit of olive oil in my pan and the onion. So this is the basic. Now, I found today beautiful turnips. It's the beginning of winter season now in Israel. So we have the best herbs and the best fruits now. So I'm going for a turnip and a carrot. And, you know, I'm very excited. The last year we, we started growing in Israel fresh turmeric. So I'm going to add fresh turmeric. It's very healthy. I choose to cut the vegetables, but normally they like grating them. I think when you grate the vegetables on root vegetables, you lose the texture. And, uh, you know, texture is another layer of, of excitement in a casserole or in a dish. So I'm just chopping the carrot on a small bite uh, and the turnip as well. What I am going to grate is the turmeric because I want the flavor of, and the color of the turmeric to go all across uh, my, my stew. 
I chose today to cut the fish like small steaks, including the bone. Uh, it's not an obligation. You can use a fish fillet, would be the same. The good thing about the bone and the head that I'm gonna insert to my casserole that it, add, it adds an extra flavor. I'm sorry for my English, huh? Yeah, your English is great. I, I want to hear your Japanese and your, your other languages from around, uh, from your cooking around the world. Well, definitely my English is better than my French. I've been cooking for a year in Paris. And trust me, a year in Paris, my French is still horrible. So the onion got a little bit of color. I'm adding the rest of my vegetables. I will let them fry a little before I add the turmeric. Actually, I will add the turmeric with the rice because overheating the turmeric in the oil might give bitter taste. You don't want to have that and you don't want to put too much turmeric because it's a very, very, very strong flavor. So I'll just grate it. Look what a beautiful color. Take in consideration when you use powdered turmeric, which you can use, you put a normally a large quantity because it's always almost flavorless. Growing up using turmeric in Israel, I thought turmeric is only used for color. It took me many years to realize that turmeric has a great, intense smell and a flavor. So I'm grating the turmeric. I'm gonna make one cup of rice. I bought not a big fish, just maybe, let's say 400 grams, about, let, let the vegetables fry a little longer. I have the turmeric ready. I prepared in advance some boiling water for the rice to make it easier for us. Super easy, very simple preparation. In about two minutes from now, all we'll have to do is just wait and near, enjoy the smells people, in the house. People want to know what kind of fish it is. This is lavrak. Uh, in Israel, we call it lavrak. In French, it's called bar. But basically, almost any white fish will do great here. Uh, I tried it last week with salmon. Salmon gets dry really quick. So, less salmon. Just a decision of the moment to show you how, how it's easy. I decided to add some chili inside, some garlic. Okay, my vegetables are... And they're beautiful. Nice and, they're beautiful. Yeah. Okay. I can tell from standing fry, here they're beautiful. I do want to fry a little bit the turmeric to help the flavors to get out. Mm, the smells are nice. I'm using basmatic rice, but uh, basically any rice which is not risotto rice will do. My favorite personally is basmati, so this is what I normally use. Now I wanna heat up the rice. I have the feeling I need some more turmeric. I was being cheap on the turmeric, which is very stupid because I don't pay for the turmeric. My uncle grows it. <laughs> so let's see. The translation we're getting for the, the English transa translation uh, uh, Anne is offering is bronzino for the fish. Oh, no. No? Bronzino? No, it's not Bronzino. You know what? Why am I saying no? I worked a lot with Bronzino the last uh, two years in New York, and it felt very different. Hmm. So, ah, but Bronzino will do the trick very well, and uh, Bronzino is a great inexpensive fish. So please do it with Bronzino. Oh, we're okay. Um, the next translation I'm getting is sea bass. Sea bass. Okay, I don't know. I'm ready for the finish of my pot, some salt and pepper. Now I'm setting the fish inside beautifully. 
if you have kids, don't put the head inside. And and for some of us that are adults, you don't put the head inside. That it's not yes, just for the kids. But, uh, okay. All I need to do now is one and a half cups of boiling water. One and a half. Very low temperature. Cover. Hmm. Wow. Taste the water. It needs to be extra salty because remember you have a lot of rice inside. So mm -hmm. it will observe all the water. I'm bringing it for a minute to a boil just to make sure. Yeah, you see it's boiling. Low temperature and we can move forward. Wow. A a Amy is telling us that she has all the ingredients except for the fish, and she's going to try to make this tonight. Except for the fish, huh? Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess she's going to have to go out and, and find find the fish or find a, a, a connection to a fisherman in Jaffa like you have. That's easy. There are, well, there are a lot of them in Jaffa. Okay, so okay, the plan well, the now... Rice is is, hmm? is is it's going to cook now for, for about 20 minutes and we're going to come back and take a look at it at the end of the show? Yeah, yeah. Same, okay. same like as you cook a normal rice. Of course, I did one cup of the base of the recipe is one cup of rice and one and a half cups of boiling water. The rest is a privilege. You can add any spices you like. You can add any vegetable li you like. Just when I'm saying every vegetable you like, I'm not talking about tomatoes or things that have a lot of water inside. We are talking about root vegetables, different kinds of chilies, uh, herbs I would recommend to use for the serving, not for the fish itself. Now let's make a nice salad. Some what, very one, la one, one last question before we get to the salad. Do, um, uh, Daphne wants to know if you soak the basmati rice first before you... No, 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 no. I don't soak it. I just... Buy a good basmati rice. I don't wash it. I heard a lot of, uh, you know, legends about what you need to do with rice. If you soak the rice, the quantities are different later on. I it's try great. to keep it easy and simple because what I realize is that when you make life easy on cooking, then people cook more and they eat better and healthier. So... All right, I'm all in favor of, of living better and healthier. So let's, we've got still more questions coming in. Uh, I'm listening, uh, I'm all yours. Fish, but, but it, we'll never get to the, the wonderful dips that I know you have. So let, let's, let's start with at least one of the, the, the first dip you're going to do. Okay, so before the dips, I'm going to make the date salad, which I'm very excited about. I started making this salad almost 20 years ago. I was doing a cooking uh, show in India. Uh, with a very famous Indian chef who taught me the great combination of dates and cilantro. And ever since I'm taking the combination of dates and cilantro to all different kinds of variation from dips to paste, to cookies, uh, to cocktails, especially that Israel has such an amazing dates. So I pitted the dates and now I'm just cutting them Make sure there are different kinds of uh, dates. The most favorable now in Israel is majul. Okay? For this recipe, I less recommend majul because it's very, very wet. And you want to choose a day that you can cut. If you try and cut a majul, it will all mush on you. So try and use a drier day that you can actually cut into pieces. Okay? that later on when we'll have the salad, you'll have pieces. So I'm cutting the date, it's very easy. My, I get the dates from the Arava, from uh, down south. There is a great production of dates here in Israel. It's been developing for many, many years. Uh, there is a legend in Israel that says that even the countries who doesn't want to buy anything from Israel, Will still will still buy the dates with a fake name. So <laughs> I think when you're good enough in something, it's a crossing borders. So you're so you're, 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 you're proud of, you're proud of the dates. I can hear that in your in your. I'm uh, proud at everything. I'm proud at the fish. I'm proud at the dates. 
I'm proud, you know, of a lot of Israeli agriculture production, I think is, is fabulous. Doesn't mention the fact that I'm a son of a farmer. So, <laughs> you know, I better be aware of what I'm saying. Anyway, probably you saw in the preview, I had a bunch of cilantro in my hand and I was taking the leaves down. So I think it's a great therapy and it goes very fast. You don't need to walk too much on it. I took some celery sticks. I cut them into, I diced them into cubes, not too small, not too big. Now I'm adding the dates that I cut in because the dates might be sticky. You know, I don't put them as a group. I spread them around the cilantro and the celery. So they won't stay together. Now I'm taking some chili. It took me two years in the States to find that the kind of chilies I like and the kind of chilies that people are used to in Israel is called long hot Italian peppers. Mm. So please, I like long hot Italian peppers. If you want to use jalapeno, you, you want to use any kind of uh, hot peppers that you like, just not too hot. Otherwise it's impossible to eat it. So, so near, again, near, I think, I think you know that, um, at the America Israel Friendship League, we're very bipartisan and we work with everyone regardless of their politics and, and their um, uh, preferences. But America is a very divided country at the moment between people that love cilantro and people that hate cilantro. So we do have a few people who have written in asking whether arugula or anything else could be substituted. Um, by the way, I am very pro cilantro, so I, I, I'm, I can't wait to try this dish, but do you have any words of consolation for people who are in the minority and, and don't uh, uh, love cilantro the way we do? For many years, you know, I was sitting in my restaurant's kitchen and people came and say, you know, I'm, I don't like cilantro, and I used to feed them cilantro anyway. And just a year ago, I read in the newspaper a great article that says that uh, not liking cilantro is in the genes. Actually, you can take a blood test and check if you're allergic to cilantro or not. So I became very sympathetic to people who don't like cilantro. But unfortunately for this dish, it's cilantro or the highway. <laughs> so for those of you who doesn't like cilantro, be patient and wait for my great hummus recipe. Okay. And either enjoy or don't enjoy my stories, but uh, <laughs> just wait for the, the next dish. So, so far near everybody's enjoying the stories because unfortunately at the moment they can't come taste uh, what you're preparing, but uh, uh, the cilantro dish, uh, let's just say there are, uh, are, are, are quite a few people who are, uh, uh, excited, and there are a couple others that are, that are, will will hopefully stay on until you get to the hummus. Okay, I hope they won't have bad dreams because of me. So, <laughs> we have celery sticks diced into cubes here. We have cilantro leaves. We have some uh, long hot Italian pepper chopped very finely. Almost done. I'm adding some olive oil, salt and pepper. Somebody stole my pepper. And at the end, normally I would put some lemon juice in here. But what will happen when I put lemon juice, the salad has a tendency of falling down and becoming less crispy. Now I want you guys to enjoy the crisp of the celery. So what I'm doing, I'm grating some lime zest on top of the salad, which give us, will give us the imagination of citrus but without the, without the actual juice. Basically, my salad is done. This is ready, let me check. Mm. This is ready to be served. Oh, this is so delicious. Mm. This will accompany a steak like nothing you can imagine. So basically this is my cilantro and date salad. 
I'll dry my hands and we'll move to another recipe. Right. For the cilantro haters, just put, put your hands over your eyes just, just uh, for, for this one dish. Hang in there. I, I promise you the, the worth will be weight. It, it, the it, next it, one is definitely not a cilantro. Can I move this away? Yes, yes. This is for me for later on. Okay. So I'm going to bring my hummus pot now. Here, by the way, there's a fan of Arba on the, on, on the line. You want to tell oh, people nice. about Nice. One of the nicest projects I made. Uh, okay, let's talk about hummus. <laughs> hummus in Israel is not only a dish, it's a religion. And people are very passionate about it for good and for bad. So what I'm going to teach you now is called hummus hamam. It's an unusual hummus. Uh, it's not the paste that you're used to. It's something different. I started making this hummus maybe 15 years ago. I took a tour in uh, Eastern Jerusalem. And uh, my tour guide, which was a very, very old Arab guy, told me, he took us to see an old hammam, and he told us that they used to leave a pot of chickpeas with water and a little bit of onion on the stove. As you know, hammams were heated by a wood. So at night, the wood was still hot. They would leave a pot of uh, chickpea on the stove with a little bit of onion. Then the men, I'm sorry, but it was only a man, only hammam. The men used to come in the morning, they used to bay, relax, and then each one would take a small bowl with the hot chickpeas and tahini and garlic and make his own start the day. And uh, the story really got into my veins and I decided I'm going to figure this out. So I did, and I think it's the most fabulous home ever you're going to make. And the good thing about it Normally, when I eat a hummus in my favorite hummus place in Jaffa, uh, I eat like three or four pitas. So the nice thing about this hummus, you can eat it with a fork. You don't need to eat it with a pita, which is much better. The downside is uh, that this hummus doesn't last, which means it's not good to be refrigerated. You make it hot, you eat it hot, goodbye. Making hummus for the refrigerator is a different ball game. I can teach you. Uh, next time. So let's nice. make the hummus. Nice. Sorry for the long introduction. So I soaked the chickpeas for a night. Then I boiled them with one onion, just cut roughly. And for one kilo of chickpeas, I put it one teaspoon of uh, baking soda and water and boil it until you see it's almost, a, it's pureed already almost. Can anybody see it? Hello? Am I by myself? No, we can see, we can see. Oh, okay, so it's almost pureed. And now I'm ready for making of the hummus. So, first of all, there is there's a, There is a question whether you can use canned chickpeas. Not everybody has fresh ones. Okay, first the chickpeas are dried, they're not uh, fresh. Ah, okay. Uh, you can use the canned ones. But you, today you can buy frozen chickpeas, which I think is better. And there is another big benefit, especially now in winter, when you boil the chickpeas with onion, there is a smell in the house like nothing you can imagine. So yeah, you can use the canned one, just keep on boiling them afterward. So a little bit of garlic. And I'm using the, the grater because I think it, it does better for the garlic. And then some salt and cumin. Cumin, if you don't like, you don't have to use. I think for this kind of hummus, you want to use cumin. I'm putting some lemon juice. Mixing together. Now I'm starting to add my chickpeas. I'm putting three nice full, let's do four nice full spoons and I'm mashing it 
It has quite a lot of water. Mm, the smell. Hmm. Then, tahini is a matter of flavor. We'll talk about tahini in, in a bit because tahini is a big issue. Well, actually I chose, I'm sorry, recipe that has issues. So I'm adding some tahini. It's a matter we, of taste, how we much We don't want anything to too par, we don't want anything too par up here. Uh, yeah, you know, we, in we life, them, in general. You know, we, we, we want a little spice, we want a little... Uh, so basically, the, the tahini will give it the consistency I'm looking for. I'm mashing it against the walls of the bowl. You can see it becoming more and more pasty and it's starting to hold together. This would be a good time for me to taste. Mm. This is ready. So it's been a long cooking for the chickpeas, but basically it's ready. Let's take some a nice plate that will show better the colors. Little bit of olive oil. My hummus is ready. As I said, this is wow. the hummus that you would eat with a fork and less with a pita. It has a great consistency and it's, you know, it's a, I think for hosting to do a big bowl of this fresh hummus in front of the guest, it will, it's a heartwarming dish. So this is our hummus. Any questions about the hummus? Yeah, when can we start? That, you know, that, that looks great. And that didn't take a long time. That's very fast. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't do a lot of dirt in the kitchen. And the main thing is, it's a super healthy food. You yeah. know, the chickpeas and the tahini, you no know, over processing, uh, very basic, vegan. I think it's a super dish. Very important to find the tahini you like. Also in the tahini dishes that we will make later on, tahini has a lot of flavor and uh, you know, each, each one has a, a little different taste. I'm using Baraka, sorry, I'm using El Arz now. Uh, it's a very nice factory from Nazareth, which I know you can get in the States very easy. Just make sure when you buy the tahini to look on the dates because the fresher tahini is not like, you know, a can. It doesn't last forever. It has quite a short shelf life, and the fresher it is, the easier it is to use. As the tahini stands, you'll get down some, uh, you know, something firm. It means that the sesame is going down, the oil is going up. It's very difficult to remix it. Try and get a fresh tahini and eat a lot of tahini. It's super good for you. So Does here, anybody one, know how much? Sorry. One of the common denominators in all your dish so far is the olive oil, and people uh, recognize that Israeli olive oil is pretty special, but uh, hard to find sometimes outside of Israel. Do you have any other favorites from your travels that, that you'd recommend? Wow, the, the main thing in olive oil is first to remember, olive oil is not like wine. It's the opposite, it doesn't age. Basically, olive oil is to be drinken or eaten only in the first year after it's been made. So basically, if we are on 2021 and you look at the olive oil and it was done in uh, 2019, it's not good for you. That's first. Uh, second, Greek make great olive oil, Spanish make great olive oil. You just need to find the brands that you like because there are very there are big differences. So, but now I know in, it's very easy to get Israeli olive oil in the states. I even bought in Whole Foods a lot, many times. So, just look for it. And normally the brands from Israel that are imported are always very good. There are Halutza and some others, uh, always very good. So, tahini just also find the brand you like and stick to it because it changes when you make when you cook and use different brands, the taste change. So try and keep to the brand you like. How many minutes passed since we, since we closed the rice? Anybody know? 
Uh, oh, close to, we're coming up on 20. Okay. We're coming up so on let 20. Me, let's take a peek. It's almost ready. So I'm so, taking Somebody the asked about why you added baking soda. Okay. If I want the chickpeas to get really soft and mushy on the pot, I have to add baking soda. Otherwise, it takes more than 10 hours to cook in order to get to this softness. So baking soda just quickens it. What, I, what would take 12 hours will be an hour and a half. So that's the reason for the baking soda. Okay, let's make a nice dip. Okay. We, we'll start with the tahini, with one tahini, and then we'll move to another tahini, and then I'll teach you something really easy and nice and special. Before you start, somebody asked about the, the pot that you're cooking in on, on this. Is that a convection? Of, of no, no, no. This is, this is actually trip, uh, you know, something you take for traveling. It's a gas. Uh, I just wanted the, for the cameras that it would be easy. So instead of cooking on my stove or on the induction, I use this. So it's easier in terms of cameras. That's all. But okay. it's a very basic traveling kit for, you know, on gas. Okay, tahini. Everybody knows how to make basic tahini, right? Everyone knows That's how to answer? buy basic, everyone knows how to buy basic tahini. How to make it is a different question. Okay, so when, when I was talking about basic tahini, I wasn't talking about the raw, I was talking about the one to eat. So, you know, let's, let's do one first white regular tahini, just the base, base, base one, okay? So the base, base, base one will always have some lemon juice. We'll always have water. We'll always have salt. And the tahini, that's the base, base, base. Now, definitely I cannot have it without garlic. So I have to have some garlic inside. Yeah, any, and, anyone that anyone that's not willing to put garlic in, we'll just ask them to leave. Yeah, no, they don't have to, but you know, in, in my family tradition, garlic is a must. And in my family, we also put a little dill in the basic tahini. So you can dream that it's white, but for me, I can't have it white. And then I'm adding the tahini. Then, Mix until the right consistency. I, and, and I know we're going to share some some the the recipes afterwards. But about how much tahini are you putting in now? It depends. I didn't measure the water, but basically, w until I get the right consistency. So as you see now, it's starting to thicken. Okay. Now, when you put the tahini in the fridge, it will get more thick. So on the first when you do it, do it a little lighter because it will grow thicker on the fridge. Personally, I, I never put it in the fridge because we always finish it. But mm. So this is the basic tahini. Let me move it into a white dish so it will be easier to stew. Okay. This is basic tahini, super easy, very healthy. Now we go for the advanced, okay? Wait, before before you go to the advanced, what is is there a name brand um, uh, of for the- For the tahini? Yeah. Yeah, I'm using El Arz. Uh, El Arz is a great factory from Nazareth, owned by a woman called Julia. A very special lady. Uh, her family had a very bad, unsuccessful tahini factory in Nazareth. Her husband died, and basically she inherited the business. Hmm. And uh, very bravely, she decided she's going to continue the business, and uh, she's doing an amazing job. It's a very, very big success now in Israel, uh, being exported all around the world. 
Lately, there was a big story about the, the factory, the, the first uh, company that uh, actually they, they gave money to the Arab gay community for, <laughs> for kids. And, you know, there was a lot of uh, anger about them in the Arab society in Israel. And definitely, you know, I want to support them now, but especially I like the tahini from before. So nice. So has has you so? By the way, I took off the fish. Okay, we turned off the heat, and in a minute we'll take it off once I make the tomato tahini. So we are making the tahini for grown-ups now. Okay. <laughs> So I'm grating tomatoes. Actually, it doesn't matter which kind of tomatoes, as long as they are very red and ripe. So I found today on the market cherry tomatoes, which are ripe enough uh, and has a lot of juice because what I want is the juice from the tomatoes. I'm grating them and throwing away the peels. If I had chickens, I could feed the chicken with the peels, like my mom does, but we don't have chickens at my apartment in Old Jaffa, so maybe one day we'll have chickens, I don't know. <laughs> of course, I was out of garlic, so again, garlic. Near where, near said where before, did you, some where people did you, don't where, like garlic. I don't know did, anyone who does like garlic. No, I bet me too. Um, wh where where did you grow up um, before you came to uh, Jaffa and, and have access to all that great uh, poultry and, and, and fresh uh, uh, food options? I grew up in a village called Kfar Warburg. It's uh, like 40 minutes uh, south from Tel Aviv. Uh, my family still, still lives there. They still uh, actually are farmers. We are very big uh, growers of dragon fruit, if you know. And uh, we grow pomegranates and apples and a lot of good stuff. And I'm getting deliveries every week from my parents, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> so, very easy. I have some grated tomatoes and garlic. I'm adding some salt and pepper. And again, some raw tahini. And this is gonna be a very, very, very different tahini from the basic one we made before. What do you call this one? Beside adults uh, tahini? Tomatoes tahini. Tomatoes tahini. Yeah, because there's no, the only adding of water into the tahini comes from the tomatoes. There's nothing else. Okay? And it, is there a trick to grating tomatoes so you don't grate your, your knuckles and your fingers with it too? Uh, yeah, you know, be concentrated. Think about the tomatoes and God while you grate. <laughs> and don't think about banks and money while you grate. And definitely you'll have better, you know, less cuttings. <laughs> People get cuts in the kitchen because they don't focus on, on the cooking and on what they do. Their minds goes elsewhere. And uh, when I cook, I just try and think about the cooking and the food and the nutrition and, uh, and enjoy what I do on the maximum. And, you know, don't think which movie I could have seen now while I'm cooking or, you know, or which friends are waiting to have drinks with me or where am I not making money now? I'm just cooking. Well, I, I think a, lo a lot of people who enjoy Israeli food um, also enjoy uh, the, the, not just the, the end product, but, but all of the the love that comes with it. I mean, it's probably true for, for, for any dish, but as you're describing each of these, um, uh, it, 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 it's clear that, that you've brought from around the world um, many of the, the influences that you had, but you, you've brought them back home 
Uh, and I'm, I'm, it, it, it sounds like you've, in a sense, gone into the family business by uh, uh, finding a way to put some new um, uh, twists on, on things that you grew up around with, with fresh uh, fruits and fresh uh, 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 ingredients uh, that are now dishes that, that have your signature on them. Yeah, not, not only that, you know, growing up in a, in a farmer's family, uh, develops your creativity because basically, as you can imagine, on the apple season, we had everything made of apple. And you know, when uh, I'm sorry to say, but you know, when when a chicken, you know, broke her leg, my mom had to make five different things with chicken for the whole week. So basically, you understand that anything you have in front of you can be used in many ways. You just need to be open-minded and curious enough to explore and try. I think that's, that's a very big benefit for a chef to grow up in such an environment. Okay, now something a bit more, something I haven't done in a long time, but it's very cool and nice. And for those of you who likes to explore and experiment and serve exciting things to the table. So I have beetroots that I cooked in advance. Just to, to be honest, you can use the ones that you buy already cooked in the supermarket. It will do the same trick, unless you're making also a beetroot salad to cook two very small beetroots just to give a flavor and color for the tahini. It's a little bit too much work. Let me wash my hands. I'm gonna surprise you now. I'm not going to add garlic into this dish. I think it's the first one that we've been making today that doesn't have any garlic. If I put garlic, it will not allow the beetroot to give the flavor out. So no garlic for this dish. I have some half a lime here. I'm taking off the peel and I'm adding the lime as a whole lime and some salt and pepper and water, of course. It's going to be noisy for a second. I apologize for the noise. You know, to make an omelet, you need to break eggs. And to need to make a beat, you need to beat them, right? Yeah, exactly. You need to beat up the beats. Okay, so I remind you, we have some cooked beets in here, half a lime, no garlic, salt and pepper. Now we are adding the tahini. Wow. Normally, this is something that I like to serve when I roast a fish fillet. So very lemony. I like to put it on the side of the fish. It gives a great color. More lemon. Lemon or lime? Lime, sorry. Mm. Okay. This is done. So we have our beet tahini. Wow. I think I'm ready to serve the fish. What do you say? You think it's a good I, time I, to serve I the fish? I can't wait to see it. I, I, I want to see what it looks like. Okay, so look at the color. So definitely the beet tahini is a great conversation dish around the table. No space, too much food, huh? There's a lot of food there. Yeah. Just... Who's gonna eat all this? I ask myself. Well, we want to look. I, I do want to hear about Arba. I, you know, I, I and I others want to know. You know. Um, until we can jump on a plane and come uh, visit you in Israel, uh, is there any way to 
to to to taste any of this stuff from your hands. Uh, actually, some of the dishes are probably being served in Arba. I was finished in Arba in February as Corona started, but uh, basically, I guess some of the dishes are still being served there. It's a great fish and dairy kosher restaurants uh, on the Upper West in Manhattan. Um, project I've been working on for three years, uh, living two years in Tel Aviv, two years in uh, New York, and now back in here, wow. across the sea, across uh, the street from the beach. So you let me get a plate. You don't seem very stressed out, Nir. You seem very relaxed. Stressed out about what? About the fish? About COVID? Well, about life? So look, we, we created this series in part because people were stuck in their homes. And um, the one thing we knew they um, needed to do was to prepare some food and, um, and as you said, maybe um, take their mind off of uh, the, the stresses and uh, uh, create something that, that feels uh, authentic and, and maybe reminds you of good times. And for those of us that have you know, spent time in Israel and, and been uh, by the Mediterranean in, the, in, in Jaffa, I think we can picture you there. We can picture you cooking. We can picture, we can smell some of those dishes even though we're a long way away. So, you know, I look at everything as an opportunity. And uh, until February this year, I was two, year, two weeks out of the month in New York, two weeks in Israel. On the time I was in Israel, I did dinner parties for private people and I was working in three different locations. So for me, it gave me the time to go back inside, be at home, do a lot of praying, enjoying, you know, more spiritual work. Uh, cooking is easy for me. So cooking first for me and my family, then cooking for guests who are coming here. So actually, I took it as an opportunity for a for a time out and thinking what's important for me in life and what I want to do and uh, reconnect to spiritual life. So I'm happy, but you know, I see a lot of stress around me. I see a lot of people really worried and unhappy. And you know, thank God I'm I'm good. Well, we, we appreciate your spreading your prayers and your love and your food in front of us. Um, uh, I think you said earlier a, the the fish cooks for for about twenty minutes and then it sits yeah. for a little bit, or or not necessarily. Yeah, I just let it sit for a few minutes in a in a closed pot. Now you'll forgive me because I really feel like I need to serve the head as well. So I'm going to serve the head, and none of you has to eat it. But I think. This is something that, you know, I like in French tradition, that if you serve a fish, you should be proud of the fish and not hide the fish. So definitely, I don't know what you see now. This is me being proud of the fish. Can, uh, Nir, can you maybe hold it up a little bit so we can see it a little more? Sure, like that. Yeah, beautiful. So that's the fish. And now I'm going to do some garnish that will accompany... Uh, I think the flavors will be very uh, good for it. I'm being nice. I'm taking parsley. For those of you who don't like cilantro. <laughs> so just parsley. And one cucumber. The cucumber will give uh, some uh, flavor of freshness that is very... Normally, we don't serve cucumber on hot dishes, right? It's very uncommon. But while eating the dish, we'll have the cold, fresh, light, green cucumber on top of the basmatic rice with the fish. I think it will be a great combination. We'll mix it together. olive oil, some lemon juice, and I serve it halfway on the side so people can choose if they want to take the fresh salad on top or not. This is the completed dish.
and and for people like me who are not afraid of cilantro, you you you, you would normally put cilantro there. Sure, I would mix whatever you have in your fridge: dill, cilantro, parsley. They are all from the same family, and they work very well with one another. Well, Mer okay. Mer Myrna said Myrna said that as soon as the we, we finish in a few minutes, she's running out to get the ingredients. She doesn't have everything in the fridge, but it sounds like uh, uh, Gita is saying, I know what I'm going to cook this week. So uh, I think you, yeah, you, you just solved a, a, a number of major uh, issues that, that, that people have. You know, we're, we're, you know, from your time in New York, we're heading into fall. People are going to be, you know, indoors more. And because of the COVID situation, Unfortunately, it, it appears things are not moving in the right direction. Yeah, I, I heard numbers are rising. I lost your, I don't hear you. Um, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Looks like I'm back. Uh, yeah, the numbers are rising and we're looking for uh, uh, things to do to keep us positive and to keep us healthy. And uh, I think uh, more than anything near Maybe you could just just point to each of the the dishes as a final reminder to everyone. Uh, when we finish, we're going to send out recipes and make available a recording. But but just as a reminder of all the dishes okay. together that you uh, lovingly prepared, I would love wow, to see. Wow, we it. made a lot, huh? We did. So we have the salad you did. of the cilantro dates and uh, celery. We have the fish, which is done with basmatic rice and uh, turmeric and some root vegetables topped with some parsley and, uh, and cucumber salad. We have the hummus hamams that we made. We have the basic tahini, the tomato tahini, and the beetroot tahini. And now, for the final dip I'm gonna make today, this is a, a big highlight for me in life. Whenever I need to make myself stronger very quickly, I make this dip. Again, something I learned in Jerusalem, uh, which is normally being served by the Kurdish, by the, by, by the Jews Kurds, uh, in Yom Kippur, at the end of Yom Kippur, to make people stronger. And I find it very helpful. So, takes exactly 30 seconds to make. That's exactly how much time we have. That's all we need. <laughs> so basically, I, I'm taking olive oil and I'm just heating it very lightly. I don't want to boil the olive oil. I don't want to cook it. I just want to lightly heat it up. That's enough. And then I have some za'atar, the spice. I'm adding to the olive oil. And then when you are feeling a little bit weak and you need some quick power, instead of going to bad chocolates and things, you just take bread. Sorry, I prepared in advance. You take some bread and you dip in the zatar and olive oil and you get your superpowers. That's that's exactly what I needed for my superpowers. That looks amazing. That looks pretty simple, but amazing. Life is simple. Nir, thank you for the superpower recipe. Thank you for your graciousness and your gummy shoot about uh, setting this up. We got to meet you when you were preparing. I don't know what what was it a, a ten course dish? I, I, yeah. I, I, I had to go on the exercise bike just thinking about that that uh, meal. You uh, put a lot of love into your dishes. Your people who have been to your uh, restaurants and your parties, you have fans. People were writing to us uh, earlier in the week when we saw we were doing this episode. They were so excited, and, and it's very clear why. Um, we're trying to find ways to bring people together and make them feel um, you know, that they've got friends that have their back and, uh, you, you gave us a great gift today that I know was what you said your, your, your goal was. And there's just love and appreciation 
that's being uh, uh, poured from uh, people all over the country and all around uh, the world from people who have called in today. So let me just extend back to a very, very uh, sincere Todaraba. Uh, people really appreciate um, um, so much that you put into this and, and uh, we'll look forward. Well, for now, we'll, we're gonna say Lahit Road because we wanna come meet you in Jaffa and see you in your element. Uh, we'll see you on the west side too, but for, for now, our, our, our vision of you is, is cooking and, and going for a walk with your dogs in the morning and getting your fresh fish to make the kind of dish that you prepared today. We'll be thinking about all these dips. Stay safe Ev to everyone. Uh, uh, thanks for being with us twice a week. We do this because we love you, we care about you, and we know that the America-Israel uh, partnership is one that is about love and is about um, coming together in difficult times as well as in joyous times. So Nir, you get the last words if you want to say goodbye. Just goodbye and thank you and stay safe and enjoy your time. Lee Trout, everybody. Right. Shavuot Tov.